This is James 3, 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Thanks. This morning in our passage in James, we have clearly two diametrically opposed ways of living. Uh, Take a look with me again at verse uh, 14, okay? There, look what we have. Okay, a life that is characterized by bitterness, by jealousy, by selfishness, a life that is arrogant, that is full of lies against the truth, uh, a life where there's disorder and there's just evilness Uh, that's what we have. In fact, demonically influenced, influenced by the world. Let let me read that for you again. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. Now, look at that description. Does that sound like the kind of way you want to live? Does that sound appealing or pleasant or uh, attractive? No, it doesn't at all. Now, let's take a look at the second way of of living. Look at verses 14, 17, uh, 15, that, that area, okay? The second way of living is based on God's wisdom, truth that comes down from God that he's given to us for our good. And it's characterized by goodness and gentleness and peacefulness. It's a merciful lifestyle. It's steady. It's pure. It's unhypocritical. It's it's righteous. Let me read that for you. Verse 13, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the goodness of wisdom. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This second way of living sounds so much better, doesn't it? Amen? Good, a a couple of you like that. Okay, go to the other way. I don't know. You got two options there, right? I'd rather live the second way, not the first way. And what's cool is that God desires this second way for us. He is a good, loving God. He wants good things for us. So he offers us this. He describes what it's like for his children to live in a way that is flourishing. But the question is, well, how do we get there? And and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Yesterday, we had the joy of going down to Petco Park uh, to celebrate with my oldest son. He was graduating with his master's degree, so we went down there as a family for this celebration and sat in the stands, kind of cool. Who gets to walk on Petco Park Stadium floor? You know, Petco. Uh, graduates, I guess, and Padre players, okay? But uh, he, he, he's there, and, and we're there celebrating, and 1,500 graduates, and by God's grace, he was number 1,480th that they called his name. So we sat through a lot of names yesterday to celebrate and hoot and holler. But we did that. And, and then we went out down to the gas lamp district and we celebrated and had some food together and some drinks. And then uh, some of our sons went home and my wife and I kind of made our way home making some stops along the way and um, just doing some errands. Well, when we were partway home, got a text from one of our sons, and it was a picture of our van that was parked out at the street, just a couple doors down from our house, space there, and it had a broken window, and there was glass everywhere. And so I looked at it, I didn't even tell my wife, because I didn't want to kind of bum her out, but I looked at it, I'm like, uh, that's kind of a bummer. Now, 
I wasn't incredibly angry about it, which surprised me. As we'll say, I'm kind of a passionate guy, those of you guys that know me. But I looked at him like, well, that, well, that's not too cool. I'm not too pleased about that. So we called the Carlsbad police and not expecting that much could be done, but they graciously came out and it was cool to have them there and we made a report. And by the way, two side things here. Number one, um, What's really cool is that at the fields, we always have had law enforcement that are a part of our congregation. And we appreciate you guys and you gals that, that serve that way. We have a lot of military. We appreciate you guys too. So thank you for your service. So they came out to, to do a report. And what was wild is when they came knocking, two of them, one of them was one of our own. And, and that happens a lot, you know, it's kind of cool. So give the guy a big hug and the other law enforcement guy's going, what, you know? I'm like, no, we're family, it's cool. But um, anyway, so they, they did the report. And, and then the other side note is this, uh, when we first moved to Carlsbad from Fallbrook to plant the field some 20 years ago, something like that, we had some law enforcement at the fields from Carlsbad. And once in a while they'd stop by to say hi and it was always good to see them. But then I started thinking, wait, okay, here's this new pastor in town, and they're starting a church, and they've got a big family, and the cops keep showing up to their home. I wonder if that's a good testimony, you know? And down the street, literally, down the street, there had been some domestic violence over and over again. The cops kept showing up there, and now they're showing up at our house. I'm like, oh, no. But then I thought, no, actually, come ahead. Come as much as you want, because if the bad guys see the cops always at our house, they'll know we have friends in high places, okay? So anyways, cops are at our home yesterday, and they're going through it and uh, make the report and stuff. But, but I, I bring this up, again, because last night I was reflecting about the situation. I was a little bit surprised that I didn't get angry about it, that I actually took it calmly. I'm like, what is going on with David Fandy? I mean, if you guys know me, I'm a passionate person, okay? Um, we just got back from Brazil, preaching in Brazil and, and working with our church planners there. If you know anything about Brazilians, they are passionate, are they? Amen? I mean, if you watch the World Surf League, I mean, the, the, the Brazilian Storm or soccer, I mean, they, they're fans, right? They're, it's like Italian, right? It's like, whoa. And I'm kind of wired that way, even though I'm not Brazilian. I'm, I'm Scottish, Irish, maybe I get a little bit from that. Maybe I have some Middle Eastern in me. Maybe that's where I get my passion. But if you know me, I'm a passionate guy. Now, passion can be really good, okay? If you are passionate about God, and I am, you're passionate about the gospel, you're passionate about Jesus. I am passionate about people knowing Jesus. I love that. I want people to know. I'm a fan, okay? But passion can also be a, a bad thing, okay? Ask my kids. I can be a little bit reactive, amen? Yeah, they're, they're, they're saying amen, okay? Um, but then again, I got five boys, okay? Come on, that kind of comes with the territory, right? Okay? You guys aren't smiling, come on. I know you parents, I've seen you. You know, your kids, they bring out the best and the worst in you. But I was thinking about this, and that reaction. And again, it surprised me. I, as I reflected, I thought, what is going on in my heart? And it might be, well, a car window, it's not that big of a deal when you think about it in the grand scheme. I mean, it's not like somebody came by and intentionally burned my house down, okay? I might be a little more reactive to that, okay? But then I thought, eh, I don't think that's it, maybe. And, but then I thought, well, maybe I'm just getting old and tired, you know? I don't have enough fight left in me for anything. But that's not really true. I, I'm going to be like Caleb. At 80, I'm going to still take new territory. So that's not it. So then I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, this stuff that we've been learning in James is starting to sanctify my life just a little bit. Maybe God's truth and his wisdom is showing up in my life, in my behavior what we read about in our passage this morning, as the Holy Spirit works in my heart, he's maybe sanctifying me, changing the way that I live, the way that I react, the way that my passions are directed. The text we read shows that there are really are two ways to live. One that is directed by God. How he changes our hearts so we live by faith. And the other way to live is just the opposite of that, which is self-directed by our old nature. And 
guided by our passions, guided by what the world says, even guided, it says, by the demonic forces of evil. And the contrast is incredibly clear. There are two ways to live. And that's what we're going to be looking at in our passage this morning. James writes in verse 13, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. James is sticking with this theme of deeds, of good works. If we say that we believe something, it necessarily will impact the way we live. Our faith will show up as real or not real based on how we live. It will affect our behavior, as he says here in verse 13. Now, remember when we began the book of James, if you were with us, back in chapter 1, verse 2. Consider all joy, my brethren, what? When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, what does it do? That produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect Results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Remember I said, I was trying to re- re-memorize those words. I'm pretty close to it there. But what we, we read there is, is this idea of trials. I don't like facing trials. Amen? Okay. No, we don't. It's not fun. I'd rather go through life on the easy path. But God is more concerned about my character and my Christ-likeness than he is in my comfort. So he sends or and allows trials to come my way to grow me. And come my way, they have this last year. You've heard me share about that, how I've had a challenging time with some trials that I've been facing. But praise God, he's growing me. He's making me more like Jesus, just like he is doing with you if you are in Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is at work in you, trying to make you more like God's son, Jesus Christ. And it's been so helpful for me to have these words of God to encourage my soul. The words say this to me. Okay, I've got some trials here, but but I'm called to have joy in these trials. Why? Because God's word tells me that he's producing endurance in my life. When I respond to those trials by faith, he's producing endurance. And you know what that endurance is going to do? It's going to create something awesome in my life. It's going to mature me. It's going to make me more like Jesus. And when I'm more like Jesus, I will not lack anything. So that's why I can have joy when I encounter various trials, because God is at work. I know that by faith. So my faith is changing the way I live and respond to these trials. It's really affecting my behavior. Without my faith, I'd be an absolute wreck. But what I believe is making a radical difference in how I live. And see how that, that works. True faith is going to affect the way you live. Verse 13 again. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Now when you think about the context here, what have we been learning? Well, think about what we learned last week. Okay, the context. Again, context is key. Last week was all about controlling our speech, how we use our words. The tongue is impossible to tame, we learned. It's full of deadly poison. It sets things on fire. It makes a mess of things. We all struggle with our words, what we say to others. That was clear from what we learned last week. But the behavior of our tongues, good or bad, is deeper than just what we say. We have to go to another layer. It's not really the tongue. What we say reflects the conditions of our hearts. The condition of our heart controls what we say or what we do, our actions. Remember the example we looked at last week, the idea, okay, you've got a horse's bit or you've got the rudder of a big ship, tiny elements that control these massive bodies. And then we looked at the idea that what is it? Is it really the rudder? No, it's the captain of the ship that controls the rudder. It's the rider that controls the bit. 
See, here's the deal. Those represent our heart. See, the heart is the issue. Our words flow out of our hearts and reveal what's in our hearts. Verse 11 last week talks about the kind of water that springs forth from a spring. Either it's sweet water that's refreshing and good to the soul and the heart, or it's bitter and destructive and brings death and poison to our lives. That fountain, that spring is our hearts. A redeemed heart lives by faith and produces refreshing living water. An unredeemed heart produces bitter and poisonous water. Look again at verse 13. It says this, this if, if, if you're wise, if you have understanding, you'll know that a regenerate heart will produce good behavior and produce good works. A life characterized by this gently leans into wisdom, God's wisdom. And we're gonna see that in our text this morning. And what is God's wisdom? It's God's truth applied to our lives. That's successful living. Living our lives according to the word of God. Now wisdom, the wisdom of God, is contrasted in our passage by the world's wisdom. And and again, this radical difference between the two. We saw God's wisdom applied to our lives leads to good behavior or works done in gentleness. But check this out. Look at what the world's wisdom or way of living leads to. And that's this first life, the life that doesn't sound very appealing when you stop and really contemplate it. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's not God's wisdom. It's not not from heaven. It's not God's way of living. No, It is actually earthly, natural, even demonic. Now, I want you to think for a minute. Look at your own life. When you contemplate your own life, do you ever see any bitterness? Amen, you do. Do you ever see any jealousy? Yeah, you do. Come on, get real. You do. Do you ever see any self? Yes, you see selfishness. I see it in my life. How we behave reveals several things about us. Most importantly, it reveals the conditions of our heart. What comes out of our mouths is really what is coming out of our hearts. My actions are a reflection of what's going on in my heart. Okay, sometimes that's hard for us to admit, but it's it's true. And then secondly, my behavior reveals what I really believe. Am I believing the lies that James talks about in verse 14? Okay, our our hearts and what we believe control how we live. Like the rudder or the bit in the horse's mouth, it's the rider, it's the captain of the ship, that's the heart. Now think about the two examples that God has for us here. This, This example of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. What's going on in our hearts when we are living this this way? Well, jealousy is the product of coveting, okay? When I want something that someone else has that I personally don't possess, okay? That's coveting. That's when I get jealous. I wish what they had was mine, and my heart is bitter when I don't get it, and it's a horrible way to live, And if we're going to be honest with each other, that pops up in our lives. That's why it's one of the Ten Commandments. We are prone to that. Okay, give me any example you want. Let's just use position. Whether it's at work or the school board or the soccer league or whatever it is, you're wanting to move up the ranks, have a little more control, influence, and they pick somebody else besides you. Like, but I've wanted that position. Or, or, or somebody else gets promoted or gets a pay raise, but I deserved it. I wanted that. They got it now, and I want that. And it eats us on, on the inside, and, and it, it just, just, we feel terrible. We feel insecure. We feel um, um, like we want to gossip about them, and we want to tear others down because they're not as good as us. I wanted that. 
coveting? Or what about selfish ambition? Selfish ambition is when I think about my needs and not the needs of others. So I live my life ambitiously to please Jesus. No, not to please Jesus. I live my life ambitiously to please my, no, not my wife, not my kids, not my mom and dad. No, I live my life ambitiously to please me because I'm the center of the world. That's what selfish ambition is. Man, our culture is rampant with that. And it always has been. Go back to Cain and Abel. Jealousy, strife, selfish ambition. Cain kills Abel. It's not new to humanity. It's always been there. I want what I want regardless of others, or regardless of what is asked of me, I want what I want. God goes on to say that living according to this wisdom or this perspective on life is earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. That's some pretty heavy wording there. Demonic, it's demonic. Doesn't mean necessarily you're possessed by a demon, but it is the way that Satan would love to see the world run in destruction. It's evil. And verse 16 describes where this lifestyle goes. Look at it. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and everything evil. Now, does that sound appealing, disorder? I mean, go into my kid's room, right? Go into my garage, okay? It's, oh, can I say this? It's a hellhole, okay? I know, I gotta repent, gotta clean it this summer, right? Disorder, but evil, okay? We see jealousy all over Facebook, TikTok, Doc and Instagram, right? Don't you wish you could have the life that they have as they post this picture of themselves on the beach? And you're like, gosh, why am I stuck in the Inland Empire, you know, or, or whatever it is, right? My wife and I, you know, a lot of trips to Australia and New Zealand, working with our church planners there, man. I, we can't believe it. We, every time we go, if we get a chance to go for a walk on the beach, and it's here too. All these girls taking po Instagram postings of themselves, and it's just like, it's all, that's all they do. And guys do it too. It's like, it's like weird, right? But that's what our, our culture is. And then this idea of this un, uh, uh, unruliness, okay, in society, we see unruly riots and, and chaos in the streets. We've seen a lot of that in the last few years. All these kinds of evil things coming at us in, in, in the world. And that's where this worldly, denom, demonic wisdom goes. Satan's goal is to destroy what God has made good. And we see that destruction all over the place. You guys have been reading and heard the news about the, the, the suicide rate amongst adults and teens. Satan wants to destroy the image of God in each precious human being. It's so tragic. And yet that's where this lifestyle goes. Two ways to live. This one goes to destruction. Or think about the horrible destruction in, in the transgender community. People made male and female beautiful in the image of God and people rejecting how God has made them and the confusion and the heartache. And then the stories after, years later, I'll never nurse a child. I'll never give birth to a kid. It's what Satan wants to do to destroy all the things that God has blessed and made good. Our world continues to go crazy. And this rebellion against God is nothing new. Rebellion against his reign, his goodness, his way for life. You know, we're told in the Bible not to be surprised that when the day comes when evil is called good and good is called evil. It's, it's wild how our culture has taken words and flipped them on their heads. You're like, how can you redefine that word? And yet it happens. It's sad. God's word tells us that it's gonna happen, and it certainly has. So it's a, it's a horrible picture. I don't wanna live that way, do you? In that, that pit of, 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 of destruction. God has something better for you. Look at, look at what God has for you. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom from God, God's word, what he has for us, that is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle, reasonable, 
full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Doesn't that sound refreshing? Don't you want to live in that lane versus the lane of destruction? God's wisdom, his truth, his ways. Since at first they are pure. There's a brand of drinking water. It's on the bottles. It's just called pure. It's, it's a blue label. I remember seeing it. And when you look through this Water bottle, you see clearly all the way through. This idea of pure, think about this beautiful, bubbling, crystal clear spring. You can see 30 feet down to the bottom. It's wonderful. You want to jump in, and then when you do, you contaminate it, right? With your Yeah, don't go in there, okay? I want to drink from it. It's beautiful. Just a wonderful picture of refreshment. Unpolluted water. That's God's wisdom. That's God's ways. God's ways are also peaceable, the shalom of God for the Hebrews, the greeting of shalom, peace. It's a greeting of may it be well with you and God. And it is because of the gospel. May you experience his peace in your life and not the striving, not the jealousy, the bitterness that we just read about. God has that for you. You know, what's interesting is in the New Testament, many of the letters written to the churches, they begin with the author saying, grace and peace to you, or, or peace and grace. The, the, the peace part recognizing the, the Hebrew um, origins of our, of our faith in God and the grace part recognizing the gospel and, and what Christ did on the cross. This is what God has for you. He has peace for you. Verse 18, we're going to dig into that in a minute. It goes even further. This, this peace that, that is this fruit sown in peace. And, and Jesus goes on and says, blessed are the peacemakers. We'll come back to that in a minute. Next, God's wisdom, the way of life is described as gentle. Ah, oh, gentleness. Now again, with five boys, there can be a lack of gentleness in our home, okay? Uh, some of it's okay. Wrestling is good for boys. Nerf wars, rugby, football, that's good for boys, okay? My daughter gets into it too, okay? Good for kids. It's good. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about how we are careful with each other's spirits and we're kind towards each other. You know, when we do premarital counseling here at the fields, I always tell the couple, I look at the guy and I say, God has called you to treat your, way, your wife the way you would treat a, a beautiful rose. A beautiful rose, man, when handled properly, it brings fragrance, it, it, it blooms, it, it blesses. But handled roughly, it withers. It looks ugly. Gentleness is for flourishing. Are you gentle with each other? Are you kind in your words to each other? This is God's way. This is the product of faith. It's also God's wisdom is reasonable. And as an engineer, I love things to be reasonable. Engineers know the way things are supposed to work. Amen? Come on. Some of you say yes. I got a friend who's a scientist who's not an engineer. He goes, no, you engineers think weird. No, we think re reasonable. God's ways make sense. Okay? They make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to the world. The one who gives away his life shall find it. Yeah, the world says, that's stupid. But for those who have experienced that, for those that have embraced the gospel, understood what God did for us, it's reasonable. It's a good way to live. It's the best way possible to live. It's congruent. It makes sense. God's way are also full of mercy and, and good fruits. Remember, mercy is not getting something you deserve. Folks, as sinners, what do we deserve? The Bible's really clear. We actually did earn and deserve the wages of sin is death. We deserve God's wrath. I know that doesn't sound good in our culture, but we do. We earned it. But God's got something better. You know what God does? He says, yeah, you deserve my wrath. And you look at the Old Testament, you see the wrath of God. You also see his mercy and kindness and compassion and grace. But it's not just the Old Testament. Look at the last book of the Bible in Revelation. God's wrath is going to be poured out. But God says, I've provided a way of escape for you. I love you so much. I'm going to take the wrath of sin for you 
on myself through my son, Jesus Christ. Uh, critics of Christianity go, oh, isn't that divine child abuse? The father abuses the son. No, Jesus willingly, he says he, he willingly, he joyfully endured the cross. He looked forward to going because of his love for us. So he redeems us. So the wrath of God is poured out on Jesus and not us. If we by faith have embraced the forgiveness through Jesus Christ, we, we, we get this mercy and, and good fruit flows from our, our lives. The second way of living is also unwavering. It's steady, it's solid, it's something that you can count on. Folks, there are not many things in this life that we can count on, amen? Okay, uh, you count on your spouse and your spouse is unfaithful to you. It happens, okay, in the Christian community and the world. You have a best friend that you, you really thought you could trust and you find out they said something that was bitter about you to somebody, they gossiped about you. You've worked hard at your company for 20 years and all of a sudden, you're yesterday's news. They let you go. There's so many things in this life. Your health is not stable. But God's ways, God's word, God's life, it's unwavering and stable. And then the last way that, that this second way of living is described is that it's unhypocritical. What is hypocrisy? Well, you guys know. It's saying you believe something and then living a different way. And we see it in our culture all the time. Folks, I, I am so thankful that, that Christians are endeavoring to get into every fabric and fiber of society. I'm glad we have Christian politicians, glad we have Christian school teachers, Christians in the military, Christians in law enforcement, Christians in accounting. Christians that are missionary, Christians everywhere. We should go out in the world and be salt. Get out there. Don't hide. Get out there. But we know politics is rampant with people that say one thing and live a different way. And it's not just politics. It's in the church, right? We have pastors, elders, leaders, community group leaders, team leaders that live duplicitous lives. They say one thing and live another way. Now, here's how the gospel works. And, and, I, and I, I'm confident, in the, not in me, but in the gospel. The way the gospel works is when we live a life where we're not consistent with what we say, what do we do? We embrace the gospel and we get real about it. And we don't make excuses. We go, yes, I sinned against you. I'm sorry. I need to ask you for forgiveness. That's not hypocrisy. That's simply admitting our sin, coming back to the gospel, embracing it. So Christianity is good when we embrace it and live by it. But this, this lane that, that God is offering us and calls us to live in is not hypocritical. And it's all sown in peace. Look again at verse 18. It says this, in the seed whose fruit, when you plant something, what does it do? It grows and it produces something. The fruit is righteousness. And it's sown in peace by those who make peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will inherit, inherit good things, what God has created. Gosh, our world so desperately needs peace, and they're not finding it anywhere out there. It's not to be found. It's not to be found, but it is to be found in the gospel. It is to be found in living in the lane that God offers us. So the question is, well, how do we get there? Well, Galatians 5, and what's awesome about this is sometimes people, and it's, it's really crazy. I don't know how anybody, like in some of the reform camps and stuff like that, and they're not really in the right camp when they go this way. Some people want to reject the book of James. They say, oh, James conflicts with what Paul said. Paul says, you know, it's not about works, it's faith only, and it is. And James seems to say, no, you have to have works to show your faith, and you do. And so see, they think there's some kind of conflict. There's not. The scripture is congruent. There's no conflict between James and Paul. There's not. But in Galatians, we read how this lane that God's called us to flourish in is contrasted with the lane of destruction. And so Galatians chapter 5, I just want to read it for you. It, it'll describe it for you in a, in a very healthy way, okay? In James 5.16, we read this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Okay, two, two lanes. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. But, verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, here, here's the one lane. We already looked at it. See, again, uh, true good reform theology marries James and, and Paul together. Go, yeah, it, it makes sense. Look at how they agree with each other. The one lane is this. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident in which are immorality, impurity. Check, we looked at purity. Impurity, sensuality. Idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Uh, one commentator I was reading about this passage said, you know, when you look at what's going on in, in, in the book of James here, these Christians, these Jewish Christians in the first century, things are coming at it and they're feeling tension within the church and there's factions happening and churches are splitting. Gosh, when churches split, that so dishonors Christ he says, one, we are one. We may have different, but we're one in Christ. Where does that split? It comes from selfishness, ambition, from jealousy, factions, envy. We looked at that already. Drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is one lane. It's a horrible lane. Verse 22, but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. We've looked at that peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now do those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires? If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. See the incredible contrast between the two ways of living? Which do you want for your life? I want this second way, life by the Spirit. I know you want it too. So again, how do we get there? Well, the first thing is very simple. Just be born again. Born again, what does that mean? Well, some of you are sitting here this morning, you're not followers of Jesus. You've never experienced new life. When you look at your life, you see some of one lane, but really, the other lane, you can't muscle yourself out of that other lane. You're like, why do I keep getting jealous? Why is there strife in my life? Why do I have addiction? Why? Why? It's because you're dead in your sin. That's what the scripture says. It's not trying to be mean to you. It's just saying the fact. You're dead. You're dead. You're in the kingdom of darkness. You're in death. When we are born again, we're taken from the kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light. Of, of light. We're taken from death and, and brought into life. That's what born again is. And how that happens is simply confessing your sins, saying, God, you are right. I'm wrong. I believe you exist. You're right. Your laws are, are right. And I've broken your laws. I've rebelled against you. I confess my sin. I've tried to do it my way. I need you to change my life because I can't live in the lane that's the best lane. I've tried, I can't. I need you to work in my life to make me like this. Those of us that are followers of Jesus, we've seen that happen. God has given us, he's birthed us into new life. That's great. But then that begins the process of sanctification and that's where walking by the Spirit begins. We, we see that in Galatians 5. Those that walk by the Spirit, What? They have newness in their life. They live with these great things, these fruit of the Spirit. We do that as we sow into the Spirit with the Spirit helping us. The, the, the Holy Spirit comes along and it guides me in the wisdom from above. It guides me in the Word of God. God has given you His Word to guide you. You, you know what He wants for you. You can't do it, but the Holy Spirit has come into you if you're a child of God and now empowers you to live that way. That's why I tell people, if you see anything good in my life, it's not me. And that's not, that's not um, being you know, a false sense of humility. No, it's the work of God in my life. God is restoring me to the image he originally had for me. And so when you see good, it's the work of God through the gospel and his word in my life. How do, we, how do we get that? Well, again, be born again. 
the Holy Spirit's working with you, and then you need this continuous renewal, washing by the Word of God. That's why as Christians, we need to be in the Word of God. Folks, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, on Sundays when you come, we sing words that are good theological words. They point us to Jesus. We hopefully have spiritual conversations. As you come in, the Puritans did that. Walking along, you speak to each other in, in, in psalms and words. It's not like you're quoting Bible verses, but you're encouraging each other. And after, on Sundays, I see you guys hanging out, talking, praying with each other. That's awesome. But core central, as we worship Jesus, we spend time in the Word of God every Sunday. And I only get 40 minutes with you presenting this. Some Sundays it might be 60 minutes. We laugh about that. But we, we aim to keep it, you know, in that 40-minute ballpark. But the rest of the week, you're getting all kinds of input, aren't you? You know? You're, you're, now, hopefully every day we encourage you. It's not yearning anything. But again, if you want to be washed in the Word, you've got to be in the Word. So we're hoping that every day you're trying to spend time in the Word. Whether you're listening to it on the way to work, better, you actually sit down and look at it. If you can read, if you can't read, then listen to it. But that you're in. And maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's a half an hour, maybe it's an hour, but, but that you're doing that. You, you're regular, you need that. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I'm aware of that. We're encouraging in our community groups, Band of Brothers, Women's Summer Discipleship, um, Women in the Word, get into the Word. That Your soul needs that. God's Holy Spirit helps you walk by the Spirit as you get into the Word. But having said that, and I'm not anti-media. I, gosh, I listen to great podcasts. There's a great one. I encourage you. I'll write you an email about it. The World and Everything in It. It's, it's, it's done by originally some Presbyterians, but it's trying to give a biblical worldview on the, on the news. It actually has some encouraging things. It's not all down stuff. But all that to say, there's a lot coming at you. There's podcasts. There's Instagram. There's, there's videos. There's medias. There's movies. I'm only giving you 40 minutes on a Sunday how in the world is that going to combat what you're getting the rest of the week? I don't know how God does it, but I'm convinced there's something supernatural that happens on a Sunday morning. That's why we need to be here regularly. God has chosen to use the elders, the pastors that they preach from his word to do a supernatural work in your life. That's why I don't give up. I'm confident that what we did in this 40 minutes this morning does something that a podcast won't do in your life, that a movie won't do in your life. Something is happening here, so, so we do that. But as you go through the rest of your week, you just need to be aware. There's other inputs, other worldviews, and that's what we see in the book of James. There is your old self, there is the world, there is demonic, trying to get you to live in that lane. And God says, I got a better lane for you. And that's through his word as the Holy Spirit works in us. And so I want you to think about that as you walk through life. You're getting input all the time. Are, are, are you, I'll just use fast food. I was going to use a particular brand of fast food. Are you, do you have a diet of Twinkies or do you have a diet of salmon or tri-tip, which we're going to have this afternoon, or whatever, you know? What are you feeding yourself? Now, God's doing something here that the rest of these things don't do. So I'm confident. That's why we keep coming. I only got you 40 minutes. It's been 40 minutes. We're done. Okay? God did something here. I don't know how, but he did. But as you go through the rest of the week, be thinking, what is your steady diet? What do, you, do you spend, you know, I'm a headline junkie. I'm a news junkie. Do I spend two hours reading the news and five minutes in this? Now, I come on Sundays. I hear the word. I'm preaching to myself. I hear from other pastors but we, we need more, and so we encourage you guys. That's how this thing is done. Be born again, then walk by the Spirit. Be in taking the Word of God, letting the Holy Spirit use it in your life to produce those good things we saw in the Scriptures this morning. And I know you want that for your life. So I'm going to pray for you this morning that the Word of God that was preached this morning does something in your hearts, and that this week you get some time in the Word, this week, the feeds that you get, maybe they're more Christian-based or, or solid, and that God will continue to transform us. It's his work in our lives to make us like lights that he wants us to be. Yeah. Father God, I thank you for your word. It's so good. I would be an absolute wreck without your guidance, without your Holy Spirit, without the gospel, without your word to guide me. And I thank you, God, that even me and my seasoned age now, 
you're still working. And, and I still see it. You're still transforming me. You're helping me not to be so reactive. You're helping me to be rightly reactive to the things that are evil and, and go towards good. Lord, you are at work in our lives. And so God, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. May they take this word of encouragement from your word and that you would continue to make them more like you, Jesus, for your glory, that we would be salt and light in a world that is so lost, a world that Satan wants to so destroy all your good things. May we be countercultural to that world and bring light and hope and peace to those that are perishing. In your name, Jesus, amen.